is up, guys? Welcome to the Meeting of Podcast. I am Andres. It is RB3. I'm Sabrina. And this is the podcast where we talk about your favorite filmmakers and the deeper meaning within their films. And we're doing a filmmaker again. Uh, <laughs> and that is the legendary Robert Zemeckis. Uh, this was recommended to us by RB3 himself. Uh, this guy has done a lot of movies. And I mean yeah. quite a few movies. So... We are going to try our best to get through the majority of them. Unfortunately, we won't go as deep as we usually do. And we also have a separate Back to the Future episode. So be on the lookout for that because that's where we talked about Back to the Future. And we mm. probably won't talk about it too much right now. Is that yeah. correct, RB3? Yeah, no, that's, that's that, exactly. I mean, we had that air last week with Mark Ellis. Um, yep. So you can check that out on the channel. And then... Uh, but yeah, this one, we, we won't really need to t touch on it that much because he has so many other movies and has had a, an acclaimed career in a lot of other fields. So it's, it's remarkable. Let's start right there. Uh, I, I want to start, and I always try to start with your personal connection to each director and their films. And, and I want to start with you, Sabrina. What is your connection to Zimbekas? It could be a movie. Uh, it could be several movies. It could be a moment in your life that you remember his movies. Uh, what would that be? Yeah, definitely. As you said, um, he has a large filmography. I mean, he has so many movies that kind of span all these different types of genres, things like that. I feel like there's a lot for people to connect to, depending on what you're interested in. So I first got into Zemeckis um, probably through Polar Express. Polar Express was probably the first uh, film I ever saw of his. At the time, wasn't interested in filmmakers or anything that much yet because I was really little. Um, but yeah, it's cool to kind of go from Polar Express and then watching like Who Framed Roger Rabbit and then Back to the Future, things like that, and just kind of get getting like immersed into Robert Zemeckis and seeing how innovative he is as a filmmaker and how like ambitious he is. So I'm excited yeah. to get into that with all of these films. Yeah, absolutely. RB3, do you have a, a movie that kind of stands out personally to you besides Back to the Future? Because I think that's kind of everyone's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Back to the Future, definitely. But for honestly, when I was a real little kid and not knowing anything about movies and just being a movie fan, uh, to me, uh, like Sabrina said, it was Polar Express. For me, it was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, I was uh, obsessed with Who Framed Roger Rabbit when I was a kid. I didn't even know Zemeckis even directed that until like I was like a teenager and I was already familiar with like a lot of his other films. And I was like, wait, he did this? Um, because that movie to me is just like, it's goat level. Uh, it's like the perfect blend of like animation, live action, you know, I always talk about how noir is like my favorite genre in movies. Um, this movie is like noir meets like Disney, which is like really, really cool. You never really see that. Um, so yeah, overall, the, uh, yeah, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is definitely my my window. And then that being said too, Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump. I must have watched that movie at least a thousand times. I could quote it day in to day out, every scene. Um, my my mom loves that movie. My family has loved that movie. We used to go to Bubba Gump. Uh, when I was a kid, a lot. Um, so yeah, everything about everything about Forrest Gump, I'm just all in for. So yeah, I've, I I I love Zemeckis as a filmmaker, just like overall. It's crazy just hearing you guys talk about it because he has so many good movies that people remember. Go ahead, Sabrina. Oh, it's funny that you mentioned Bubba Gump because I I can't even believe I didn't mention it. But yeah, Forrest Gump was a staple in my childhood. One of my dad's favorite movies, and uh, we would go to Bubba Gump all the time. And my dad's allergic to shrimp. And we'd still keep going. I'm like, you cannot be in here. And he still would go. I don't know why, but it's just so funny when you mentioned that it brought back all those memories. Mm -hmm. uh, I swear, <laughs> I think all three of us have that same Forrest Gump thing because I have the exact same thing with my dad uh, and my family as I was a kid watching Forrest Gump, being very confused uh, as a kid <laughs> watching that. I was so confused. Uh, and I'm still kind of uh, but <laughs> crazy how like our parents kind of put that onto us after our parents kind of put Back to the Future onto us as well, which mm -hmm. is kind of the Zemeckis tradition of like your parents kind of telling you about this movie and, and seeing if you're like old enough to see it, uh, which I always think is kind of funny because Zemeckis is the kind of guy who blends the 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 ratings. I don't know what how else to describe it, but ratings and tones of a movie to make it feel like it can be for kids, but at the same time putting very adult themes in there that are very not for kids. <laughs> and I think yeah. he does it with like almost all his movies. If you think about it, like look at Romancing the Stone, look at uh, um, 
uh, Back to the Future, Forrest Gump. Like these are all movies that you, oh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Rabbit is a perfect Rabbit, example. Yeah. yeah, where it's like, it's like you said, it's Disney meets noir and noir is like hard R. Mm -hmm. And if you water it down with Disney, what do you get? You get like a weird PG slash PG-13 type mix yeah. of it's, like ratings it's literally it literally has a baby who's like smoking a cigar like the entire time <laughs> it has roger rabbit uh, uh, uh like having an affair like with pictures of him playing patty cake with a woman as if that's like this huge sex scandal it's like amazing it's, it's so funny yeah yeah and it's like you're like this ain't for kids but it's kind of for kids like it's it's this weird thing that zemeckis likes to do which i think is absolutely fascinating and i don't think I don't know, RB3, do you think we're ever going to get something or can you name something that's similar to Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Um, no, I don't think. I think that's kind of like right? a, a flash in the pan kind of thing. I mean, there have been other live action animation like kind of crossovers that they either lean way more towards kids or way more towards adults. But there hasn't really been one that kind of shot straight for the middle like uh, like Who Framed Roger Rabbit does. Which one was for adults, if you remind me? Just because I know the kids one you're talking about. Yeah, I always think of Ted. I always think of Ted as like okay. That but is that of... is that visual effects? Yeah, I mean this. I mean Ted is like CGI, uh, like okay. kind of character. I, I I always think the movies are kind of Ted one and Ted two are kind of cartoony too. Um, but yeah, I I I. But for me, like that's all. That's like on the extreme side of like the hard R, and you get something like Sonic. That's like. Um, or chipmunks you know, or chipmunks yeah that's like super very kitty. very kitty yeah yeah super super kitty um but to me yeah uh who framed roger rabbit is like the perfect in between and the thing is with with who framed roger rabbit versus all the ones that we were listening before it has like 2d animation which mm -hmm. is so cool to blend that live action with the 2d animation versus like what we have now not to say it's like artsier but i just i feel something else like it almost feels like nostalgic Mix. I know we're gonna get into it, so I don't want to say too much. But yeah, mentioning all of that, I really do think Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Like, we're not gonna get anything kind of like that anymore. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. You're absolutely right. I almost feel like it's harder. I mean, obviously, I'm not a, a, an animator, so I, I, I don't know from personal experience. But I feel like what Zemeckis did with Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and I like how I was gonna go in order, but we're just doing Who Framed Roger Rabbit right now. Are we starting? Um, <laughs> I, I guess All right. uh, I think it's one of those movies that is timeless because of it, because it's so unique, not only with the blend of tones and how it has a lot of stuff that kids can enjoy and adults can enjoy, but also just the, the, the sheer aspect of making a 2D animated figure that live action actors can interact with is so hard to do that. Like I said before, no one has really done it since, and no one has even attempted it because yeah. of how Ro of Who Framed Roger Rabbit just absolutely nailed it. it it's mind blowing to think that, and 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 the idea that this movie was actually really successful, and we we haven't seen anything like this. I I, I don't know yeah. what do you guys think of that. The fact that more studios aren't making that combination. In a, in a, like you said, uh, uh, Sabrina, in a, in a more artistic style. It is it is really interesting that you bring up the point. Obviously, none of us are animators, but um, the interactions, even what we could see with the Jessica Rabbit scene where she's performing and she's dancing with people, she's twirling around like um, a, why can't I think of the name? Like a tie? Tie. Oh yeah, tie, yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, she's like twirling around a tie. She's like touching people. Um, I feel like it's something like that is so difficult, but I think in the right hands in the future, it would be so beautiful if somebody could make a film similar to this, mixing that 2D animation with the live action, because the way Who Framed Roger Rabbit did it, it has these classic characters and it's kind of mixing it with these mature themes. And as we said, it reaches like a really wide audience doing so. Like we can still enjoy it. We can still feel a little bit of our childhood in that when we're watching it and we're seeing those cartoon characters. Um, and I just think it's a technical achievement in that way, like blending that live action with the 2D animation. Um, something that I thought of like Mary Poppins, like the old, yeah. old Mary Poppins, that type, those, I love those for what they did with that. And if somebody were to do that in the future, I would be a huge fan. And I'm like, I'm like crossing my fingers hoping because I do enjoy the 3D animation 
blending in um, a little bit with things like Ted and Sonic. Um, I think that's really cool that we're able to do that, but something like this just feels so classic, feels so nostalgic. And I'm a huge fan of that. Yeah, no, I was I was gonna bring up the Mary Poppins uh, point too, because you know, that's also Disney, Peach Dragon did the same thing where it had a, a, an animated character in a live action setting. Um, but with those films, you could clearly tell like there's a, still a degree of separation between, oh, the dragon's on this side of the frame and the kids on this side of the frame. You could tell in Mary Poppins, like Mary Poppins is the only live action thing there. So they clearly animated everything around her. Um, so it's like with Who Framed Roger Rabbit is the first time you see like interaction between the animated characters and the um, and, 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 and animation. And it's very like, like they go out of their way to kind of show you that. I think that's a testament to Zemeckis. I mean, he's always been like a visual effects whiz just throughout his entire filmography. I mean, we talk about Back to the Future, we talk about Forrest Gump, which won best visual effects when it came out and broke a lot of ground when it comes to visual effects. Um, and then you talk about, um, like, you know, we were gonna mention later on in the podcast, things like Polar Express, um, that kind of ended up um, even further blending the, the, the lines between animation and live action. So it's like, Throughout Zemeckis' his whole career, he's always been like fascinated with like this technology, um, and you could you could see that work to perfection in a lot of his movies, including Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah, I mean, if anything, it's it's almost a timeline of his career. Uh, before we went on air, I told you guys about a video by Patrick H. Willems, a YouTuber who does a lot of great video essays, talking about the evolution of Robert Zemeckis' filmmaking career and how he became obsessed with digital progression in film uh technology in film so to say and the, the idea that he did it in forrest gump he he made something that was so you know groundbreaking the idea of interacting with footage that you know is so old and the fact that he can insert uh tom hanks in that footage and make you think that he was actually there and do it so so seamless like it, it feels like it's so real uh and then he he would just evolve from there like you said rb3 he's one of those directors and we always talk about him right we talked about it with the wachowskis i'll name him again lucas george lucas the goat uh james cameron uh robert zemeckis robert rodriguez yeah. um steven spielberg. Jackson, steven spielberg peter jackson um these are guys who not only want to make film but want to blow your mind with what they show on the film, which is something that he's literally currently obsessed with uh, as he's making more of these movies that he kind of just made it his thing and he hasn't stopped making it, which I find to be absolutely fascinating. Uh, what do you think, uh, what do you think this is gonna go? What do you, where, where do you see his career going from here uh, as far as continuing this technology development, Sabrina? Oh, gosh. Um, well, you said, I think before we went on air, that he was continuing to make these types of films. I haven't seen anything recently. He did have Welcome to Marwin that came out not too long ago uh, with Steve Carell. So I really, just from the trailer that I did see, because I was super intrigued about it, and it wasn't as well received as I was hoping. Um, but from the trailer, that also looked beautiful. From what I know, it's like he has like dolls, and he lives in like a world of like dolls, like a fantasy, like imagination world of that. So the way they portrayed in the trailer, it looked beautiful. So if he could continue on with these types of kind of like out there, really interesting ideas of like with visual effects and visual storytelling and things like that, because even with Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the thing that I think is so special is like the world building they have with this noir world of like a blend of cartoon characters and real people that are just interacting like this is normal daily life. Um, it's something that I think is really special. So if he can go on and keep evolving his visual style like that, I I would be a huge fan. Like I'm really something. I I would love to see something like that. As I said, I did love Who Ra Who Framed Roger Rabbit so much when I was a kid, and I still enjoy it when I'm an adult. And like something that's interesting, I don't. I'm just this is off the top of my head, but like some random idea. But like Taika Waititi's doing a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory um, animated show. If I, I don't know, I don't want to like speak for Taika, but it's, I think it would be so cool to have something like that, another like 2D animation. And I want to see 2D animation um, mix in with live action. Something like a story like that with a director like Taika, I think that could be really cool if he has the right people to back it. Um, but if not, I want to see Robert Zemeckis like go back to this type of thing. I think it would be really special and like 
especially with the way box office is going and the way theaters are going. Um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a success. Um, critically, everything, obviously it won three Oscars for um, sound effects, visual effects, and um, I think editing. Yeah. If I, yeah. So I, I think if he goes back into that wheelhouse, I think he could create something really special again. It's so crazy to hear you say that because again, the video that I just mentioned is all about how he's basically Patrick H. Willems is like begging Robert Zemeckis to stop doing this. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, because because first of all, it's not financially successful since mm -hmm. Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Like it just hasn't been a success, especially Welcome to Marmon. Uh, uh, Marwin, uh, Marwin. Welcome to Marwin, which which cost a lot of money because that's a yeah. lot of CGI yeah. and that's a lot of special effects and made like no money. Um, and the ideas that he's just putting in there are aren't really connecting with people. Uh, you think of movies like Beowulf that no one liked. Uh, you yeah. think of movies like uh, um, well, the most uh, the most notorious example is Mars Needs Moms, which was yep. the Disney film that literally had a $200 million budget, if I'm not mistaken, and made $34 million at the box office. Um, yeah. So it, it, that movie flopped so hard that literally Robert Zemeckis' uh, studio, where he does uh, that kind of brand of animation, literally got shut down as a result of that of that movie flopping. Um, he didn't direct it, he just produced it, but that just goes to show that um, it, it was tough to communicate that. Beyond the Polo Express, which we're gonna talk about later, Polo Express kind of um, lit that whole genre up to begin with. Yeah, it's almost fascinating because, I mean, if I'm being honest, and again, going off this video and, and kind of what Patrick talks about, it's the idea of how Who Framed Roger Rabbit is almost a, a, a timeless capsule of mm -hmm. that time and how this kind of blending of animation and live action and tones of both very kitty goofy stuff and very adult themes doesn't really have an audience in modern times. Like in, in the year 2020 that we live in now, there's not really an audience for this kind of blending of animation and blending of tones and making it kind of like a PG-13 R-rated movie that kids can't watch and adults don't really get because it's a little too kiddie. Uh, yeah. That's why I, I think it's fascinating that you say that, Sabrina, because it's literally <laughs> the opposite of everything you said. So I was like, that's so cool that you're saying that. Yeah. Uh, because no, it's, I just not, remember. it's currently not working. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I remember the last time I watched Who Framed Roger Rabbit was probably um, maybe like a few years ago. And I just remembered how much I loved it. And I just thought it was so stunning and how I don't really see anything like it. Um, I, I This is something that is like kind of almost like an anomaly if, in his career with like this type of animation and everything. Um, but I think it'd be really interesting to go back to something like straight up like this. Um, but I'm not going to tell Zemeckis how to run his career. He, he got it handled. Um, cause we'll, we'll get to it later, but I have, I have some stuff with the Polar Express. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> again, animation. I feel like we can go on forever, but I feel <laughs> like it really is a fascinating glimpse inside the world of animated movies in America. Right. It's the idea. And I've talked about this on Schmoes, like, Oh, shout out to Schmoes back when that was a thing. Um, I, I went on this rant about the idea of American audiences not really accepting an animation that is geared towards them and how, uh, you know, adult audiences don't really respond to adult themes inside an animated movie, uh, especially, especially 3D animated movies versus, uh, you know, anime, which is like literally like primetime TV in Japan. Uh, they literally watch it like they watch, you know, the biggest show on TV. Like I, I said it on on Darina's stream, but I said it's like you're watching Lost, and 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 instead of Lost, it's like an anime show. And how uh, American audiences don't have that same connection; they're almost put off by adult themes it, in animated movies. It's because there, it's because uh, unfortunately um, America's been like branded, and there's kind of like this perception that animation is automatically for kids, like it's only for kids, it's only for children. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. I, I think that's like a really bad way of looking at animation. It's some great adult American animation. I mean, there's that show that David Fincher produced on Netflix. It was something, robots, uh, something, something. You know what I'm talking robots about? Robots, sex, love? Yeah, yeah, that one. It was actually yeah. really interesting. It's actually a really, okay, really interesting. It. It's a really, really interesting adult show. But Netflix didn't even continue it because 
it's just seemingly like nobody watched it, nobody talked about it. Um, and it costs a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. There was, was another. Yeah. There was another one with the girl who played Alita Battle Angel. I think it was on Amazon Prime. Oh, it's called Undone. I oh, heard yeah, that I one was amazing. Oh yeah, because that's yeah. like that's like animated, <laughs> right? I was, I was yeah, it is. But but it's a different type of animation. It's the uh, mm -hmm. I forget what it's called. It has a word, and and I apologize for not having that word off the top of my head. But it, but it's the kind of that blending animation that makes makes it look almost like a watercolor uh, animated style. Uh, and it's supposed to add to the story of the supernatural themes that the story has. Uh, it's beautiful. It, it's it's thought provoking. It's weird. It's Latino, which is like one of the few Latino things there is on TV, which is why I talked about it before. Um, so yeah, I, I, Undone is great. But again, I, I'll go with off what RB3 said. No one really saw Undone. People yeah, liked exactly. it. They talked about it, and they were like, "This is great." But as far as like normal people, like general movie going audiences yeah. or general TV watchers didn't really see it. Uh, my thing is too, is like I go back to the cost of animation and that's kind of what people don't get is like animated movies cost a lot of money, whether it's CG animated or whether it's 2D animated or whether it's cartoons for kids, whether it's Trolls World Tour, apparently that had like a massive budget. Um, yeah. That's so also a lot to do with the music too. Music for trolls. Is, is yeah, because they true. have a lot of covers. Yeah, on that yeah, one. yeah, they have a lot of songs too. But it's also like, you know, Seth Rogen has like a body list of how many people he killed off Sausage Party. Um, mm -hmm. I know that's a joke, but it's kind of true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that didn't work, right? Because it cost so much money that that people were gonna, you know, tear down the whole animated studio that made that thing. Uh, and it just didn't reap the benefits that he was hoping for, which is another example of how audiences are kind of resistant towards any any style of animation, uh, which is why I'm fascinated by Netflix, by the way, because I've, I've read dozens of articles and I've, I've wanted to write articles about how Netflix, uh, I, I read this article off Motherboard, um, I'll give them credit because they're the ones that said it, that Netflix is, is trying to, to change that and they're single-handedly buying animated studios. I don't know if you guys know this, but they're literally like animated studios that went out of business. They're buying them uh, and restarting them. Korean animated studios, Japanese animated studios, and American animated studios. And they're trying to make animated shows and animated movies a thing. Like you said at RB3, uh, a robot sex love. Uh, they're doing it with Castlevania. They're trying to pimp that out as cr like crazy. Uh, Bojack Horseman, obviously. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, Big Mouth is yeah. another one that's pretty popular. Yeah. Uh, and now they're doing it with Masters of the Universe. They want to make this giant, epic Masters of the Universe anime show, uh, but no Japanese actors, purely American actors. Shout out to Tiffany Smith for having that uh, in her pocket, too. She's casting one of the parts. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but that's a kind of example that Netflix is single-handedly trying to bring back r-rated animation i don't know if you guys have seen castlevania but it's hard hard r like very hard r uh and and that's the kind of style that netflix wants to deliver and they're doing it with with anime right they're doing it with original anime because there's a ton of original anime rb3 is currently watching one uh, why don't you give that yeah. a shout out rb3 uh, beast b stars I'm, I'm probably gonna be the only one dying on the <laughs> screen but that that show okay but like the show i'll say this i love b stars i think the story is actually great um the writing not the greatest, but the animation is absolutely insanely gorgeous. It's insanely gorgeous. It's like they do like the. They, it's like it's it's presented as like a normal two D anime, but all the characters are like kind of three D ish, and you could you could. It's weird. It's hard to describe, but the way it's visually presented is like it's it's beautiful. It's it's, it's insane. And you could tell they spend a lot of time and a lot of money animating this thing. Yeah, but but that's a great example of, of what Netflix is currently trying to do. They're they're almost taking this formula and trying to like smash it into American audiences' heads and be like, you're gonna like R-rated animation, period. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I think it's so fascinating. I've talked to Emma about this stuff for like hours uh, because she's also really into anime and stuff. And I talked to her about the idea of what is anime and what isn't. What is the style of animation and what defines a genre. Um, which is kind of what I, I want to go back to. If you had to, if you had to say, what is the genre of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Sabrina? I know that's a tough question. Yeah. But what would you say? Like, how would you define that? 
Oh gosh. Um, I feel like RB3 is a better one. I <laughs> Is it just like, <laughs> oh God, I don't know. What do you think, RB3? Um, like I said before, it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of like old school noir meets yeah. animated, but it doesn't, it's tough because it doesn't, as an animated film, it's not a particular type of genre of animation either. Like, cause it is, it's a mixture of original characters and then it mixes the older, safer Disney template that like you're kind of familiar with. But then Looney Tunes is his own separate thing. That's a lot more slapstick, a lot more violent. So it incorporates that as well. So it just, you know, it's like ultimate originality. And I mean, I think that's just the through line of Robert Zemeckis' career. We talked about Back to the Future last week. Is it sci-fi? Is it comedy? Like, is it just like a nostalgia piece? I think the, I think the biggest through line of Robert Zemeckis' filmography, though, that I think you could kind of pimp, pimp out and, and kind of see through is his kind of obsession with, with nostalgia. Because even though uh, Who Friend Roger Rabbit is an animated film, most of his set is like 1940s old school hard right. rock noir. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Back to the Future, mostly set in like 1955. Forrest Gump yep. we're going to talk about is literally the entire history yep. of America. So like a lot of his, uh, a lot of his filmography deals with like this idea of nostalgia and this idea of reflection and this idea of like looking back and then taking what we learned in the past and then building on forward. Um, so yeah, I think Who Framed Roger Rabbit is totally indicative of that. Absolutely. And obviously we're going to talk more about his uh, current movies and his, and his future movies, but, but let's go back in time guys, uh, mm. back to 1973, uh, which I believe was Robert Zemeckis' first films. At least that's what I have in my notes right now. Uh, it's a short student film that got the attention of Steven Spielberg. Mm. Uh, it's Steven Spiel I think he went to USC, right? Uh, Robert Zemeckis went to USC. I believe he if he I believe he did if he didn't he was part of that generation but I will say he did he did donate a generous building to USC the Zemeckis Center that is the ho the home of uh, Trojan Vision which I worked for for many years not many years a couple of years um, that's like the USC TV TV station and network he has a gorgeous building that is both a TV network for USC and the huge visual effects lab that is used for the visual effects department of the school. There you go, man. That's what he loves. He loves those visual effects. Uh, but yeah, so it started with that uh, student film that he made. And, and Steven Spielberg kind of took a took a liking to him. He saw him almost like an apprentice. Uh, right. Obviously, Steven did this with a lot of people, but credit to Steven because he executive produced uh, uh, quite a few movies, including Back to the Future. Uh, we talked about it in our Back to the Future episode, but Steven actually pitched Back to the Future to Universal, which is what got him to greenlight it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows if that would have been the case if he didn't have the name of Steven Spielberg behind that project. Right. Uh, so after that, he went on to make, I think he wrote 1941, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Spielberg film. He yeah. Wrote, yeah, he wrote 1941. Uh, he became friends with uh, Bob Gale. Um, and he started making movies. Uh, I know he did uh, Used Cars or Car Salesman. I think that's what used, it was called. Used Cars, yeah. Mm hmm uh, he did use cars and then he did, um, he did one before that. Oh, I want to hold your hand. That's right. Uh, and, and they were both kind of equally so, so received type movies. It didn't really move the needle too much in his career until we have to mention it. Romancing the stone, mm -hmm. Michael Douglas, uh, hired <laughs> Robert Zemeckis, uh, to direct this project because he saw talent in him. Shout mm -hmm. out to Michael Douglas. Uh, and this movie, I remember this movie. I know this might be too old for you guys, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was a hit. This was like a massive freaking movie as far as how successful it was. Uh, do you guys remember this movie at all? And and, and what are your thoughts on it? Uh, Sabrina, you're saying no. <laughs> I've, I've never seen it. I definitely have heard of okay. it. I, yeah, but I've never seen it before. Uh, RB3. Yeah, this is, I've, I've seen it um, like when I was, you know, first going through um, Zemeckis' like filmography as a, as a, as a young one. And I, I, it is fun. It is like a more of an adventurous kind of like um, Indiana Jones type of type of feeling, like flavor. It, it does go back to like that old school, like pulpy kind of adventure, you know, let's go on a quest kind of kind of thing. So I really enjoy it on that level. Um, and then, you know, the, and then, you know, going back to Back to the Future, he did this, he wrote Back to the Future before he actually did this movie, but Romance in the Stones was a big enough hit that it gave him more credibility in, in order to get Back to the Future made. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's also a big, a big part of um, his legacy as well. 
That's exactly it. Yeah. Without romancing the stone, you don't have Back to the Future because people remember who he was simply because of that movie, because that movie was a hit. I, I, I remember that much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was able to launch his career. And obviously, after Back to the Future, he was able to make the projects that he wanted to do. Uh, and, and right after that, I believe the next, the next biggest movie he did would be Forrest Gump which is a multiple Oscar winning movie that kind of swept the nation in a weird way. Because again, yeah. RB3, I want to go back to you and say, what is Forrest Gump? What is the genre? Like this movie is so all over the place, so bizarre that I almost can't define it as far as what it is. Yeah. I, I, it's a, it's a war movie. It's a sports movie. It's a, it's a romantic epic. It's a, uh, um, it's everything. I think. I think for me, what I kind of boil it down to ultimately is satire. It's like the one of the biggest satire, satire pieces I think of all time, and it's something that I didn't really realize when I watched it a bunch of times as a kid. But watching it in today's context, it is the entire movie essentially boils down to the only way you can make it in America <laughs> is to just be this idiot who just goes with the flow. Uh, it's to just be this 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 guy who just who just does his thing. Um, and it, it goes to show like, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're dumb enough, you could be the greatest football player of all time. If you're dumb enough, you could be one of the greatest soldiers of all time. As long as you're good at taking orders um, and you're confident in what you do, you could do that. And then in the later half of the movie, when he does this big run and he's running across America and it, it really no motivation to do it whatsoever. Um, he just says he wants to do it just, just because he wanted to. Um, it inspires this entire movement behind them. And I think that's also one of the biggest pieces of, of, of satire too. Like a dude with literally no motivation, just, I think they even <laughs> say in the movie, if you if uh, if you have an idea and, and a beard, you, uh, you can start a movement. So like, that's just what, that's just what you know, this movie kind of represents. To me, it's always been satire um, that I love about this movie. Sabrina. Yeah, no, I, I really love this movie. I love everything that you just said, because that really just, it boils down to all of that. I mean, from the beginning we get like, run Forrest run and then he's on the football field and the guy's like run and he's like okay and then it's like somebody else tells him like oh let's start a shrimp business he's like okay <laughs> and just right. like keeps just going with the flow keeps doing his thing um I and I know obviously like everybody calls like Forrest Gump like dumb but at the same time because he is in the movie but at the same time I feel like they like kind of toe this line with the character where he's just very sweet and not, I wouldn't even say dumb. I want to try to think of a better word. Like maybe just like kind of just chill and naive. Like he's just like doing his thing, not too worried about it. Loves Jenny and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Forrest Gump, like he adds so much heart to the film being the person that he is because he is so like simple. He just, he's just going with the flow with everything. Um, I don't know. I'm really attached to the character of Forrest Gump. I love, I think he's so sweet. And just, the, I remember like once, cause I watched the movie when I was a kid and you know, you don't really understand everything as you said, Ace. And then like you watch it more times and you just keep getting more out of it and keep remembering. Like I just noticed like a certain like sexual reference in it that I never noticed in my life uh -huh. uh, just recently, like a year ago. And I was like, wow, I've been watching this movie and never noticed that they meant this. But I don't know. I think it's I think it's really special. I do love the way it jumps with all these time periods. You see John Lennon, JFK, people like that. And then he just stops and he's like, and that man was shot. And then somebody shot his brother too. And then she's like John Lennon and the TV static comes up and it's like, that man was shot outside of his apartment. And the yeah. way he just narrates everything. Um, sometimes narration can be kind of like a cop out with storytelling. You know, it makes it so much easier to kind of go through it with narration. Um, but I think, again, that they toe that line with it where it's not. I think it adds so much more to the film, like, if there weren't narration. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and I just want to tangent about Forrest Gump. No, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's what the whole point is. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's fascinating, RB3, because everything you said is true. But at the same time, people want to try and take away a bigger theme, a bigger message inside this movie. Do you think there is one? A bigger theme? Yeah, um, like politically, what is this movie trying to say? Oh, well, it has so a, many that's political a, moments. That's, that's a that's a that's a conversation that people are still trying to figure out today. Is it um, is it uh, a left wing movie? Is it a right wing movie? Is it a 
like what does it actually represent? Um, it to me is it it to me is to me that's why I, I kind of branded a satire because it kind of makes fun of everybody. Like as equal as it, you know, like I said, it's a great war movie, but it's also a great anti-war movie too. Like it does kind of like it shows you how not how how cyn it, it kind of has this cynical approach to like everything. Like it, like it, in terms of like you you see like this war and you see like this this tragedy happening, but at the heart of it, Forrest is like really the only like kind of even though he is like kind of slower and challenged he is the smartest one on the battlefield and compared to a, a guy like uh gary sinise's character um um who loses his legs um, um um i'm forgetting his name off the top of my head um but his character is like obsessed obsessed with the idea i have to die on the battlefield i have to die on the battlefield and the force is like why life is way more valuable than that um everything everything that everything in in, in that sense is really is really deep and profound and then you think about um you know like i said like the religious context of like somebody being able to follow this movement just simply because people want something to believe in um it kind of has a heartwarming approach to it but has more of a cynical approach to it too um the idea of like these and then but on the same time just have you know that's that's kind of the right wing commentary has on it but then the left wing commentary is like oh like protest like are a good thing, but then sometimes like you see what Jenny, when she tries to join the protest and she has like this abusive boyfriend, um, I think even to the point where I believe it's the uh, S SGTs, I think that was the group represented in that in that part of the movie. Um, they actively disowned this movie because they thought it represented like their movement back during that time period. Um, so literally people have been arguing about what this movie really represents. Um, to me, I personally think it just represents America. Like it just, it's like the idea of like, yeah, it, um, like things happen on both sides. People behave on, behave in extreme ways, and um, and, and both and both on uh, more conservative leaning people and more liberal leaning people. But at the end of the day, um, being being an being an American is just being a chill, humble, kind of you know naive, maybe a little slow um, dude who somehow stumbles his way to the top, no matter what. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I, that's why, that's why I kind of extrapolate from that. It's, it's absolutely fascinating because again, you think of like, this thing has a lot of references to the hippie movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, it, and I was like, is it making fun of it? I think it kind of is. <laughs> it definitely is. It makes fun of, that's what's funny. This movie makes fun of everybody. It makes fun of everybody. It makes fun of, it makes fun of hippies. It makes fun of, um, soldiers. It makes fun of, um, it even makes, and listen, I mean, I shouldn't be laughing at the part where it makes fun of black people, but it makes fun of black people. It makes fun of white people. It makes fun of football players. It makes fun of uh, uh, ping pong players, which it's hilarious that that becomes like his, like his, his calling card. Um, it makes fun of like shrimping people. It, it makes fun of everybody. Yeah. I mean, if this movie came out now, Sabrina, <laughs> um, <laughs> How do you think the, the, the reception would be? Would it be the same as it was then? The thing is with this one, I think it came out at a perfect time where it's still beloved to this day. You talk to anybody, everybody's seen Forrest Gump. Everybody at least at least like likes Forrest Gump. But if this were presented right now, I don't even know how I would feel about it. If this was like a brand new thing, you never know. Um, you know, not to say people are like really sensitive, but people, this is a very gosh, politically charged time for everybody. We see it everywhere on Instagram, Twitter, like all over the place. And some people just see a portion of something and then just run with it on every side, you know? And so even though something like this, even when it makes fun of liberals and things like that, I can like find it funny because again, there are pros and cons to every single thing. Even though like I am a liberal, there are points in the film with like the hippies and everything where I'm like, yeah, it's funny, whatever. Um, but yeah, if this were to, I don't even know, like if this movie were to come out in this time period, if it would be like focusing on that, that same exact timeline, or if it would go like later on and do a different timeline, but it would be, it would be interesting to see people's reactions. There would be so many think pieces. It would be think yeah. pieces wow. with this movie. Um, and that's what, and that's what makes it kind of fun. And even going back to making fun of protest is literally the funniest moment of the film to me. It's like when he gives this whole long speech in front of the Washington Memorial and his mic goes out and nobody hears him. And then at the end, he says, he said like one word at the end and the whole crowd was like, yeah, yeah. It's like, starts cheering. it's so funny. 
But yeah, I think that's just, that's just, it's just, I think that's why it fits into the satire because satire is usually like making fun of like a political thing or a greater world context thing. And I think it does that really, really well. It, it, it's such a, it's such an interesting, fascinating, uh, a sociological question is, is I, I thought about this quite a bit, especially being in, back in my production company, when I talk to all my friends is who gets to make fun of who, um, who gets to do that is always the question, right? It's not the idea of doing it. It's not the process of doing it. It's who does it, which I think is a fascinating conversation. Cause again, this goes back to a social economic issue of making movies in the first place, sure. because let's face it. Most people who make these movies are white dudes. Uh, and, and they're the ones rich making fun of the thing. Yeah. Rich white yeah. dudes. Uh, because it, in order to make these movies, you have to have some sort of money or backing. Um, so that's kind of the, the the generational movement we've had in film is kind of the same people making the same kind of movie over and over again. The the question there, the reason why I brought up my production company is because I've I've said it before on the podcast, but I was the only non-white dude there uh, out of all the employees, every single employee. I was literally the only non-white dude there. Uh, and I always was like, well, this is crazy. Yet, uh, hanging out with those guys, I, I kind of got the vibe of like, what it is and what it isn't as far as satire and as far as comedy and as far as their love of like comedy and improv and all this kind of stuff that naturally makes fun of people and me having the time to spend with them naturally made me forgive certain jokes that maybe I wouldn't have forgiven if it came from like Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh. Uh, I probably would be like, screw that guy. But if it's like one of my homies from the production company, who's just as white, I'd be like, yeah, he's funny though. <laughs> yeah, it's the I, idea of who's saying it. I guess is what I'm saying. I think I think it is who's saying it, but I think it's also again towing that line of like balance. If you're making fun of both sides equally, kind of it it almost not. I don't want to say cancels each other out, but it it kind of does. And of course, like in in today's world, people from both sides could find certain things to pick apart when it makes fun of their own. But then if you watch this as a whole. You can kind of see, like it again, as RB three said, literally makes fun of everyone. Yeah, and I, I think, think the perfect. And I think the, the the perfect thing about this movie is that it does it it, it blends it blends it, it's like perfect duality. It blends the satire and the funny and the making fun of with a lot of genuine heartfelt moments. And I think that's why it connects with so many people. I think that's why it wins it won Best Picture. I think it toes the line of comedy and drama really well. And I think it. And you know, going back to like who makes this movie, who's making the jokes, I think it is appealing for people both because you know, even though it takes like the perspective of like um, of of having, even though it takes the perspective of like being done by like rich white dudes who are making the movie and producing the movie, and it kind of seems like they're almost like disingenuously making fun of like American culture and Americans and 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 and. Uh, most notably poor people. I think that's what the, the, the whole thing with Forrest is, is that he grew up poor and that he made it to the top. But I think it, it does have a level of sincerity of like, you actually do care about Forrest. You actually do connect with his character. And when you talk about who's making the joke, at the end of the day, Forrest is narrating the movie and you're seeing it through, you're seeing it through Forrest's eyes and you're connecting through it through that level. And you know Forrest is a genuine, you know Forrest in and of himself is a genuine guy. He's not He's not making fun of the movies or not making fun of the characters, even though the movie is, but he's not. So it, it kind of gives it that extra layer of like, oh, he's he's a genuine dude. This is a genuine movie. And even though we're here for even though some of the stuff is here for laughs, there's a lot of stuff here that's here for actual um, actual, you know, uh, uh, actual genuine emotion and actual heartfelt moments. And that's why I think the movie does really well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, obviously, guys, we've gone a little longer than I wanted to, and that's my mistake. Uh, before we go to break, let's go to your film, RB3. Uh, let's go to Contact. This yes. is a movie you were excited to talk about. Uh, tell me why. Um, to me, I'm so glad I have the opportunity to talk about Contact, contact on camera, um, because this is easily one of the most underrated science fiction movies ever made. One of the most underrated uh movies just in general i mean i feel like nobody even talks about this movie and i always have this theory of like whenever a director wins like best picture he starts winning a lot of awards or nominated for a lot of awards his film after that is usually like his most 
risk taking, ambitious movie because they have like all the opportunity and all the acclaim in the world. I feel like Contact like perfectly fits into that um, because it's like it's literally it, it 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 didn't really connect to a lot of people when it first came out because I think it is kind of really heady and really ahead of its time. But I liken it to the sense of Arrival, where it's about like where the first half of the movie is kind of spent on well. The beginning of the movie, you're spending with the entirety of uh, a Jodie Foster's character as a kid and her um, interactions with her dad and how that inspires her to take on this this path of like mathematics and science and studying and all that stuff. And then it goes to the idea of like, oh, there is extraterrestrial uh, 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 contact that's happening um, out there in the world. So we have to go out and try and explore that and try and dissect and try and figure out how it's possible to even uh, make that connection. And then. Um, but then in trying to make that connection at least to all this like international turmoil of like all these different government agencies fighting with each other of oh, who are we gonna send up there? It's gonna be our person, it's gonna be our person. Um, but, and then at the, at the heart of the story is still about connecting and, and communicating. So then by the time that Jodie Foster ends up being the person herself that goes up there and, and, and seeks out these answers, um, it becomes like a whole, it's, it, it, it turns into a whole different movie about what's the meaning of the universe? How far, how far are we removed from the rest of the universe? How, um, what's like our, what's like our conceptual like understanding of what aliens are? How far out do we have to travel? Um, all these different questions. And then it comes back to earth and then people start even questioning if she had this whole experience to begin with. People think it's like a dream or it's like some sort of thing that happens. So it, it, it goes on like a lot of really deep science fiction themes and plot points and all this stuff that is really, really fascinating. And I, I just, I'm, I'm incredibly in love with this movie. Dude, when was the last time you saw this one? Um, I haven't, I haven't sat down and watched it fully in like a, a, a year or two, but um, I did go back and rewatch like a lot of clips, like in preparation for this, just cause I was ecstatic. So before we went on air, Sabrina and I were like, oh, what is contact? I just looked it up <laughs> right now again. I saw this when it came out. <laughs> Really? I remember, yeah, uh, and and I just looked up the images and I was like, oh yeah, I totally remember this movie. This movie is wild. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it, it just fried my brain as a kid. I was like half creeped out, half confused, half right. fascinated, half like really interested in what was going on. So I'm totally with you, man. I have to rewatch this movie. This is something that I haven't seen literally since it came out, which is 1997. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when you guys were born, um, <laughs> or yeah. not even. <laughs> I was no, born. 97, 97, 97. Yeah. Uh, I, and I saw this, uh, when I, when it, when it came out. So I'm going to go back and rewatch it just because of URB3 and because of my memories of this movie that came flashing back to me right now. Yeah. Uh, it's um, really and, fascinating. And it's really deep on a lot of levels. The whole idea of like, that she like for, she spends years of her adulthood trying to make contact and there's no stimulus of contact there's no there's no signs or whatever so the government keeps trying to like shut down her program but then there's a there's a communication message that comes through from one of the satellites after she plays with it for a little bit in like a last ditch effort and it sends back a signal of the 1936 speech that Hitler gave before he like gained to power. And the reason that speech was given is because the reason that speech was used is because that's widely believed to be the first speech that um, can, that had enough, had enough broadcasting power to be broadcasted uh, uh, across the universe. So then um, the fact that these aliens were like 26 light years uh, away meant that it took 26 years to get there and then 26 years to come back. So by the time it comes back on the projection on, on, on the screen, it's like, it, it comes like full circle. Um, and that's like, and the idea of like, this is, that's the first connection that an alien species will have to like the human population and to the world, that kind of belief in that kind of ideology. And wow. the fact that it like plays into that greater theme of like international turmoil in order to get this, access of like information and knowledge um, and, and, and kind of uh, elaborates on like the extremism that goes into the idea of science and, and this disbelief in like a greater universe and this kind of central idea that we are the centers of the universe. It's just really, it's, it's all around just powerful stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's wow. yeah, no, I, 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 can't, I can't stop thinking about this movie. 
Um, and but and then oh, it does all these really big sci-fi ideas, but then it boils down to the story of a daughter and her father, and that just it comes all full circle. And I just I I can't believe it's, it's it's brilliant. I think people, if you haven't seen Contact, uh, people who are watching at home, like please watch Contact. That is one of the most underrated underrated movies of all time. I will watch yeah. Contact. Yeah, uh, you yeah. you imagine like if aliens came down to Earth and they were like, I mean, I've I've seen this tweet before, so it's not like I'm breaking anything, but they're <laughs> like, take us to your leader, who is the one who rules Earth, and we're like, uh, the guy in the White House. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he, he has full sentences sometimes. <laughs> um, that's our I would leader, just guys. Give him like Tom Hanks or something. We're like, this yeah. is our, this is America's actual dad. Yeah, no, we we definitely gotta give him Tom Hanks for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Out of everyone, we're like Tom, yeah, Hanks. Tom Hanks. But it, but but it's a, it's such a similar thought, right? It's the idea of like what uh, what would be the first message to to extraterrestrial life? And the idea of that being Trump, it just yeah. kind of blew my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what it yeah. come down to. But honestly, yeah. um, honestly though, like I, I talk about ambition. I talked about ambition before. Like we started. I think out of uh, Robert Zemeckis, who's had an, a full career full of ambition and pushing the edge and all this stuff. A lot of times, his movies push the edge in terms of like technology and cinema and cinema and filmmaking. But I think on a story level, this is his most ambitious, and it definitely felt like it. I, I felt I, I'm happy that. You know, Forrest Gump was popular enough that he was able to make a movie like uh, Contact, and it's still. And it, I don't think Contact made a lot of money. It wasn't like a big, big hit, um, but it it still resonates, I think, in today's like modern science fiction. Like I said, Arrival uh, plays on a lot of same themes. A lot of sci-fi. Interstellar, exactly, exactly. Interstellar, exactly. It all plays on a, a lot of those same themes that I, I'm really, really um, excited about. So cool, dude! Thank you for bringing yeah. us that because I'm definitely gonna watch that. I'm a, I might even watch it tonight. Who knows? Yeah. Um, Already, guys, that's our first half. Make sure you guys stick around for the second half, where we're gonna be talking about Castaway and the other great films of Robert Zemeckis. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh. With the four fifth divide you in half, you getting at me equals a club half. You do the math. The following is an excerpt from our video about underrated films on Amazon Prime. Enjoy! The Handmaiden, to me, is one of the most interesting romantic drama films that I've ever seen um, because it is so much more than that. I hesitate to say the word masterpiece, but I think this film truly actually deserves the title. This is directed by Park Chan-wook, um, and it's an erotic thriller which is loosely based on an English novel um, called Fingersmith. So the movie is set in the 1930s Korea, and it's centered around wealth, deception, lust. Um, it has deeply focused characters that are rich with like wit and passion. Uh, we really attach ourselves to them, but at the same time, we're rooting for them. And we also understand that they might not have the best intentions and they might not be the best people. So it's kind of an interesting mix of all of that. And I feel like Park Chan-wook kind of toes that line in a very, very beautiful way. The story is twisting. It keeps you heavily invested throughout its entirety. The visual cinematography and production design heighten the atmosphere of the world that we're kind of immersed into in the 1930s Korea um, setting that they have in the film. And so like this, along with the stunning screenplay and meticulous direction, just create a film that's so special and completely worth viewing multiple times. It's a little graphic. I definitely wouldn't recommend it for somebody above or under the age of like 17. But if you're 17 plus and you're ready for something that's kind of a mix of horror, erotic thriller, comedy a little bit, um, this is definitely the one for you. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. What is up, guys? We're back talking about Robert Zemeckis, and now we get to the 2000s. Uh, very special time, the 2000s. I don't know if you guys remember. <laughs> uh, but we start out with What Lies Beneath, a Harrison Ford horror movie. Uh, that I don't think any of us have seen. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, okay, we can move past it, guys. We can <laughs> do right. it. Uh, I, I'll permit it. Uh, but this is uh, Robert Zemeckis' attempt at a horror movie. So obviously, if it doesn't stand out too much here, at least he's trying a different genre. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. But what really made this stand out was Castaway. This movie was huge. Uh, I remember this movie coming out as well. And, and how big and how, you know, 
talked about this movie was, especially for the performance. Uh, what is your guys' connection to this? And I'm going to start with you right away, Sabrina. What is your connection to Castaway? Um, I don't, I love this movie. I remember the first time I saw it, it was kind of one of my biggest fears when I was a kid was just like being deserted anywhere. I always thought I was going to get kidnapped at like shopping centers, like things like that. So then of course I see this movie and I didn't really understand like the deeper meanings behind it yet, but you just watch this and you see the isolation that this character, uh, Chuck, Chuck goes through. Um, Tom Hanks performance is absolutely incredible. And I just remember, yeah, watching it when I was really little and then revisiting it later on and just kind kind of like another adult fear of mine is missing out on things in life. And the way in the beginning, right at the start, he's kind of missing out on this relationship with this girl really being the way it should be because he's so focused on work, priorities, things like that, which is something that is still a very real adult fear of mine. Um, so I just love the way it handled all of those different things. I don't want to go into it too much because I want to give you guys a chance to speak. So <laughs> RB3. Yeah. Um, I, I also saw this movie when I was uh, younger, uh, caught it on TV um, when I was when I was younger. And honestly, I really enjoyed this movie. Um, like Sabrina said, being stuck on a, on a deserted island is very, very a big fear. I think it should be a big fear of everybody, to be honest, because um, it, it kind of you know, I think what this movie kind of shows is that like people in today's era, like in the modern technology era, we're not necessarily prepped to, <laughs> to hang and survive yeah. in the same way that like, you know, I'm sure our, our brothers and sisters two, two or 3000 years ago were. Um, so yeah, I, th yeah it's, it's incredibly scary. I actually remember, um, I remember actually, ha I remember like the whole Wilson uh, volleyball thing, like becoming like a, like, I guess it was before meme time, but like it, everybody, everybody like was like Wilson, Wilson, like back yeah. in the day. Um, yeah, and that to me is just hilarious. Well, well, not just that. The fact that I mean, we, we're talking about Robert Zemeckis. How many legendary lines does he have with all his films? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about think about Back to the Future. Think about Forrest Run, Gump. Forrest Run. Run, Forrest Run was always yeah. yelled at me when I started running as a kid in the playground. <laughs> Uh, and they don't even know what they're referencing because they probably haven't even seen it. But, but yeah. yeah, I mean, how many legendary lines does this life, guy life have? Life is like a box of chocolates. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, back, anything from Back to the Future is like a legendary line. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is mind-blowing how he's able to incorporate modern American cinema in a way that we remember almost every line inside his movies that that's credit to Zemeckis absolutely and obviously uh, his co-writers too mm -hmm. yeah, yeah no absolutely and and I think um particularly with with a movie like Castaway that became like such a big like cultural phenomenon I think it it it, it, it kind of you know I mean everybody knows Tom Hanks everybody loves Tom Hanks and you know Tom Hanks at, at this point he already won like two Oscars um, for uh, both Philadelphia, if I'm not mistaken, Philadelphia and um, Forrest Gump. Um, so like at this point, it was like, we already seen like a lot of Tom Hanks were familiar with the personality of Tom Hanks. So people are just, people love Tom Hanks and seeing somebody like Tom Hanks going through this kind of situation, like being stuck on an island, somebody who we already associate as like, like you said, being America's dad, like mm -hmm. imagine America's dad being stuck on this island and just like, you know, being, having a, rub sticks together, cre create fires, like all of the different stuff. It's just crazy. Yeah. And, and this kind of sparked a, a, almost a genre of deserted island TV shows, movies, reality shows. Oh, like yeah. Survivor, for crying out loud, yeah. mm -hmm. is like the biggest reality TV show of all time. Yeah. And it kind of takes everything in this movie and just makes it a reality TV show. And, and I, for one... I'm not a big Survivor guy, but I've seen a full season of the show, and it's it's the real deal. <laughs> yeah, like people go hard in Survivor. Like if you can make it on that show, you're kind of a badass in, in a certain way. Um, but I, yeah. I I kind of want to go to you guys to to tell me what is your favorite deserted island shows, movies, kind of inspired by uh, episodes. It, it doesn't have to be a, a show or a movie. It could be something else kind of inspired by uh, Robert Zemeckis and Castaway. Uh, do you guys have one off the top of your head? Um, that's tough. I mean, there's been so many, because I one thing I think to immediately, even though I didn't watch all the series, but I'm familiar with a lot of episodes of Lost. 
Um, Lost is a perfect example of like a sci-fi mm -hmm. kind of version of Castaway. Um, I also think to movies like Life of Pi, um, yeah. Yeah. like even though like it's very different in subject matter, almost to a certain extent, like Captain Phillips, um, mm -hmm. like yeah. you know being trapped on like this boat uh, instead of being trapped on the island. So yeah, I'd, I'd probably I'd probably shout out Lost because even though like I haven't seen all of Lost, it's still like a big cultural impact and of, of what I've seen of it because I've seen like a lot of episodes of it, I just haven't seen them in necessarily order or whatever. Um, that's the, that that's that's really dope stuff right there. Yeah, I you I remember one? Lost would come on after like American Idol sometimes. So I mm. and I was obsessed with American Idol. Yep, so I exactly. So I've seen bits and pieces. Don't really know the story too much. Um. But a movie, the one of the ones that came to mind was that recent one with Shailene Woodley, Adrift. If you guys yeah, saw it, did you see that? I yeah, I saw it. I wrote yeah. a, I wrote I wrote a paper for my Hitchcock class about that movie. What really? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What, did, what I, was it good? It was great. Yeah. Really? It was, it was interesting. Um, I don't want to give anything away, especially because you haven't seen it, because it isn't what you expect. Um. It's not just like a full on story, like similar to something like Castaway. It kind of has like a spin on it, which is like what I think is interesting. But um, yeah, that was that was the first one that came to mind. And it's pretty recent. I think it only came out like a year and a half, two years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. It's it's fascinating to think the type of inspiration major movies can do to genres and to productions. Right. Where if someone if, if a studio head is waiting on a script and they like it, but they're not sure about it. And then a movie gains popularity that seems similar to that script. People just start green lighting it left and right. It happens yeah. all the time in Hollywood. It's literally catching the wave or riding the wave, whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, of other movies that gain popularity. Mm -hmm. I, uh, think, I think a story like something like in Lost and like Adrift and like Castaway is really interesting because it kind of captures this like loneliness and isolation, like I said before, in a way that's different because another, another fear, <laughs> adult real fear of mine is just like loneliness and isolation, anything like that. So right. having it be put into a scenario like this, like, you know, he hops on a plane, he's the lone survivor. Um, he has to fend off the land and not just that, just continue to be as emotionally stable as he possibly can throughout this entire time. He's on there for like, or he's there for like four years for four entire years. He has to do that. He's just, he's losing his mind. He, um, Oh my God. I forgot her name. Kelly. Kelly's the girl. Um, he draws Wilson Kelly and he's having these conversations and you're kind of going through all of this with him during it. I think that's why we get so attached to his character. And it kind of, we see, we see the journey from the start of the film where he is so invested with his work and he is not maybe having the right priorities in life. And then through something like this, which is a very extreme version of what we would feel in normal life normally, mm -hmm. because we could all kind of have those periods where it's just kind of a weird time, weird headspace. You're feeling a little bit lonely and maybe self-isolating to try to figure yourself out. And then, so he's doing that for four years. And then you could kind of come out of that type of situation with more understanding, more clarity, things like that. Unfortunately, in his case, um, he can't be with Kelly. Um, but that package is so like symbolic throughout the entire movie, the package with the angel wings. Mm -hmm. And it even ends the film. I saw, I've seen people before, like on Twitter and things like that, complain about the ending, about how it was like unresolved. And I completely disagree. So I don't know if you guys have any... Cause I have, I have a whole take on that. Uh, I would love to hear it. Um, I, 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 I don't, I thought it was a great ending. I thought it worked I, perfectly. Me yeah. Too. yeah. Yeah. No, that's what what's I thought. The, and what's the beef? I saw, no, I just saw people saying that it was like unresolved and we didn't really get any closure with him. And I'm like, I feel like we got all the closure we possibly could. Like, um, even he's literally at a crossroads after he delivers the package, like he lost Kelly, but he gained that kind of like realization of, priorities in life and then he is able to deliver that package that is basically like almost kept his faith this entire time besides mm -hmm. also kelly and then he's at a literal crossroads like he's literally at a crossroads and the car comes and it's the girl and she's like you look lost and it's literally she's she's saying it he he literally looks lost but also like you know he's lost and then he kind of he he's like looking off into the distance and staring off to where she drove. He knows where she lives now. And it's kind of like, oh, is he going to follow that girl? Like maybe he has another chance at love. This girl, without knowing it at all, kind of gave him this like bit of faith 
to continue on all the time with this package. Um, I just think it's really interesting and I absolutely love the ending. So every, I saw people talking about it and I was like, it's very resolved. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I think it's totally resolved. And I think, you know, like you mentioned, it's a perfect movie about like human psyche, like our connection to socialize, mm -hmm. our need to socialize. It's actually kind of a perfect quarantine movie. Like, when right? you think yeah. about it. Is like, it a perfect I, I, or is it the worst quarantine movie? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to cut out of this with like a volleyball best friend that I'm going to name Wilson. Just like a huge, like long hair. Yeah. All of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, if anything, this, this movie not only did the whole deserted island thing, but this movie almost did the survivor, survivalist movie that... <laughs> Like how many survivalist movies can we name? I mean, for crying out loud, The Revenant um, mm -hmm. is one that that is similar. Unbroken. Right. I don't know if you guys saw that. Oh yeah, uh, well, I read the book. The Gray. The Gray. The Gray. The Gray uh, with yeah, that, that, that man versus nature kind of. Yeah. 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 Movies that we've had like that come out all the time, and some of them are kind of Oscar baity, like Unbroken and like The Revenant, which are very mm -hmm. much like look at this guy suffer like a mother. And then give him yeah. an Oscar for it, uh, which is kind of a different style of, mm -hmm. of of performance. Definitely. And the thing is, like, I I truly do believe, as I said, Tom Hanks is America's daddy. If we needed like a number one person to just be like, yo, everyone loves to I'm not daddy like that. I was gonna like say that. <laughs> you said dad before. Okay. It changed. Okay. Guys, you we're dropping something. the last, we're dropping the last DY is just dad. America's <laughs> dad. Drop that Y. <laughs> Yeah, it's just dad. Um, but he is such a great, great actor. He is so talented. As RB3 said, I think he had back-to-back -back Best Actor Oscars with Philadelphia and with this one. So, like, that is just, that says something right there. And he is so iconic in himself with his voice, everything he's done. And seeing him take on this role and sacrifice his body. Again, when you do something like this, you do need to. Like, he gained 50 pounds, shot the beginning of the film, and so there could be a dramatic weight loss, you know, yeah. then versus him being on the island. Because obviously, if you're living off the island, you're not going to look the same way that you do now. Mm -hmm. um, and they had to they had to shoot the film over a, per a long period of time. And they shot something else in between while he was losing the weight to finish off the film. Oh, um, so it is just interesting. That. Yeah. So it is interesting the way um, I, when I say they shot another film, Robert Zemeckis and like the same team that was on this film shot something else. Um, and then they got back to it with, with Tom Hanks, once he was able to lose all that weight and get his body the way they needed to for this role. So he, he put in the work, like he, I, it's, it's one of those things. Like when you hear like, oh, Leonardo DiCaprio really ate like a, what did he really eat? Like a bear liver? A or like, yeah, a horse horse. Liver. yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. It's stuff that you hear like that. But for, for this one, because it is, it takes so much time. I feel like it's almost harder than just doing one little thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, that's a, a whole different question that I know I have for you guys now because it sparks a different conversation, almost a conversation that I had with you, RB3, a while back about the idea of performance and the idea, this is coming off The Revenant, right? The idea right. of if I make a movie where I'm freezing my ass off, I lose 50 pounds and I get the shit beat out of me, do I deserve an award, right? I mean, that's kind of the thing. Like, where is the line between performance and acting as far mm. as torture and as far as sacrificing your body and your mind, literally, like for crying out loud, like Leo actually literally got the crap beat out of him, you know, same with the mm -hmm. actor from Unbroken, same with other actors who've done these kind of like yeah. almost suffer movies. I don't know how else mm -hmm. to call them. Like you suffer through the pain and you actually physically suffer. I mean, Christian Bale is notorious was, for it. Yeah, I was just going to say, somebody we see throughout his entire career going up, down, all different ways in weight, buff, like playing Dick Dick Cheney? Was he Dick Cheney? Yeah, Dick yeah, Cheney. Yeah, playing Dick Cheney. Um, things like that kind of going, I don't necessarily think that something like that deserves um, so much praise. It is, it is truly, again, it boils down to the performance because you can do all of that and then give – not saying any of these people have, but like then just not give like the greatest performance. But I think, I think with Castaway, this entire movie, because of the whole isolation aspect is completely riding on Tom Hanks performance. And I think he delivered, I think he deserved it. Yeah. The, the only reason he didn't win the Oscar that year is because he ran into a freight train with uh, Russell Crowe and Gladiator. Um, so 
that that that's probably that's the only reason why he didn't get it that year. But yeah, I think you know, like to address this point, like if that does that necessarily constitute like an Oscar win, like fluctuating and all this kind of weight. I mean, is it does show the effort, but at the same time, it's like, um, like you said, Sabrina, it, it really comes down to the performance and like the individual yeah. uh, performance that they're giving. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I didn't mention Michael Fassbender in Hunger too. That's oh, another yeah. one. Uh, mm -hmm. He, I mean, my God, those guys get tortured throughout the yeah. entire movie. Yeah. Uh, so that's another fascinating example of what is performance and what is award worthy, I guess. Uh, but yeah, all that comes from Castaway. Before we move on from Castaway, I have to do the whole deserted island thing, guys. Right? <laughs> I mean, let's say, let's say, what, what three personal items are you taking on a personal on, on an island on a deserted island? Oh. Let's start there. That's an easy one, right? It's easy. Easy. Um, okay, you guys go first. I have to think. name one. Name one personal item. Come on. I gotta go. Yeah. Definitely hand sanitizer. Okay. <laughs> Sabrina. Yeah. Like a pillow. A pillow. I think a, a, I think a pillow you'd need to be comfy, like as, as comfy Man. as possible. You know what I mean? Because yeah. like I don't need my phone, I don't need makeup, I don't need the internet. None of that is gonna mean anything when I'm on, on a deserted island, but I feel like comfort is one of those things that you're gonna kinda need. So I think yeah. a pillow. What about a tarp? Yeah. yeah. Tarp. Tarp is good. Take from tarp the rain. A good a good tarp. A, a yeah. nice blanket. You can get you can get water off it too, like if you make a <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. the little you like the you make like a little luge. A... Yeah. Yeah. I'll say an air yeah. purifier, a water purifier, water purifier. Oh, that's, that's clutch. That's yeah, clutch. You, need that. you need that. Uh, what about one album you have to keep on the island? Ooh. One. One. Oh, I know this. Right. So you can just we can play it like this is yeah. just like purely you only, you're stuck with one album on your on your iPod. Oh hell yeah. Uh Carrie and Lowell by Sufjan Stevens. Oh, mm. that's a classic. That's really is that going to yeah. make you feel good when you're alone, Sabrina? Yes. On Sufjan a deserted Steven, island? <laughs> he, he, he always makes me... He, it, this album is like a warm hug. It's literally like, okay. that's how it is. Listening to this is like, Sufjan is just like, I'm here for you. So, yeah, how about you, RB3? Uh, I'd probably put, probably put a Kanye album on there. Probably something like... Me too. Uh, probably put uh, late, registration. late Registration. Okay. Okay, I was actually thinking the exact same thing, dude. Right. <laughs> That's why we're friends, bro. Hey. Uh, yeah. You guys said right. that. I'm like, Sufjan Stevens. No, but yeah. I, I, That's I, a good pick, though. That is, it is. But I, I want to, yeah, I, I want a boogie on yeah. my island. <laughs> I'm a parley yeah. island. Late, late registration is like perfect in terms of like being a, a blend of sad songs and sad like, and turn up and songs. Hype. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, you you got it all there. You get you get the wide range. Sure. I can't believe That's you great. guys really thought the same album. You guys are ridiculous. <laughs> I'm not joking. I was gonna say I you was guys gonna are say, ridiculous. But you <laughs> yeah. uh, hey. All right, final one. What is your inanimate best friend object on the island? <laughs> what is your Wilson? I feel oh. like oh, this is good, and I know you guys are gonna agree with me. Also, another item: notebook and pen or something like that because like uh, you're gonna want to write like imagine just yeah. thinking thoughts and not being able to put it down i think i would go insane yes. so i need i would need to write so my best friend would probably be like one big sketchbook or one big journal or something okay so i could do that's all kind of that. cheating but i'll accept it <laughs> that, that's that's pretty good um yeah i uh i don't know with. some uh, yeah maybe yeah if you, if you got like a teddy bear or something like that um, yeah. I would probably, I'd probably go with, uh, um, I'm trying to think, man. I mean, I, I, I might have to go, I might have to steal Sabrina's and say like a pillow or something like that. <laughs> ah, yeah. pillow. You could nice, cuddle man. with it. Cuddle. Yeah. Sleep. Rest all on that it. stuff. Yeah. 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 Good deal, guys. Alrighty. Uh, let's move on to his other movies. And I know I had to mix it up like that, but I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> after this, we have Polar Express. This is him kind of getting back into that whole Te technological development, CG animation that we talked about in the beginning. Uh, any any huge takeaways from this movie? I know you said you had one, Sabrina. So I want to go straight to you and tell me what, what your biggest thing is from this. The thing is, I like this movie. I liked it when I was a child, but I could never get over the fact that the animation style, they look like they're dead inside. Like they have no light in their eyes. And that always freaked me out. I do enjoy this movie for what it is. I really do love it. But that animation style, man, 
it like kind of creeped me out. <laughs> it it creeps me out more now than it did when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, it really is the beginning of him trying to figure out how to do it, right? Yeah. It's the idea of, of perfecting the technology that's available to you and being limited yeah. to your time. Uh, because obviously now it's a whole different story. But then again, it took different minds and different directors to get where we are now. Yeah. Um, but this is him attempting to do it. I mean, Polar Express is literally that style that he's still kind of into right now. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, not Sabrina. Uh, RB3, your biggest takeaway from it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I always love like the Christmas. I love Christmas movies. I love Christmas as a holiday. Um, so this is very Christmassy. I'm always happy to see a good Christmas, um, vibe thing. Um, uh, so yeah, it's really, really good stuff. I, um, I haven't really connected with this movie in a long time. Um, since probably I was, I was younger. Um, so my, I mean, yeah, I, I, I appreciate it for the groundbreaking technology. If I'm being honest, I don't really 100% like remember it all that much. Um, but like to it, it, it is noteworthy in the fact that um, even though I may not personally watch it every year at Christmas, it has become like a Christmas staple for like an entire generation. And um, I think it, um, you know, like we talked about in the, in the first half of the podcast, it pioneered a whole new brand of, uh, of, 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 of animation and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, this movie means a lot to the animated community, to the CG community. The fact that nowadays we have actual characters interacting with real life actors. I mean, obviously, I always talk about Endgame, but the idea that Thanos is the villain and he's all fully CG character uh, through the acting of Josh Brolin, because I still feel like that's a performance, um, yeah. is really fascinating. And we wouldn't have that without people like Zemeckis, people like Cameron, people like Lucas, people like Peter Jackson, all those kind of directors who really want to push the envelope. And think about it now. Think about last year, uh, RB3, with uh, Alita Battle Angel and the idea of kind of using the similar effect of almost amplifying the human features. Uh, that's kind of what Polar Express, Polar Express was. And, and the idea that Robert Rodriguez brought that back to make this anime-style film in Alita Battle Angel. And almost every character in that film has some sort of human humanoid animation added to their already human body uh, for the CG effect. It's really fascinating for sure. Uh, let's move on from that and let's go to, let's go to uh, flight. I know this movie means a lot to you, RB3, because it's Denzel Washington. Yeah. Uh, he's flying a plane. He's drunk. He's drunk flying. Yeah. Don't drink and fly. <laughs> Don't drink and fly. That's, that's kind of the number one rule that should be followed. Don't right? drink. Yeah. So um, actually funny, I, I love this movie. When it, I, I remember seeing it opening weekend. Um, when it first came out, I have the poster in, uh, we're not in my room. I'm in my living room right now, but I have the poster mm -hmm. in my room. Um, just because I like this movie so much. And obviously, as you guys know, Denzel's one of my favorite actors of all time. Um, and he like puts on a clinic in this movie. Um, I, I think just overall, I mean, the, the idea of like, um, uh, this alcoholic dude who's like has this like big responsibility that like he seriously like doesn't take seriously. Um, it's so weird and, 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 um, but yet like so personal too, like you really follow mm -hmm. this dude's like struggles and his journeys. I know a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people criticize this movie for like its depiction of alcoholism. You know, a lot of people say like, it goes like too far, like he's like drinking uh, obsessively. Um, but I personally think like it, it, it shows, it shows like the temptation that like kind of lies, like the scene when he's in the hotel room and he's just kind of like, he keeps staring at the refrigerator and he just like won't stop looking at it. Um, and he just like goes and goes and goes until the next morning before he gets on that on that faithful um, flight. Um, so yeah, all of that is just really, really uh, crazy, crazy good stuff. Um, I really, I really like this movie. Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, my brother uh, watches this show about flights gone wrong. Have you heard about that, RB3? I, I haven't. No, I haven't. So it's a show. I forget what channel. It might be Discovery Channel that airs. And it's almost like, a, I think, like a weekly show that mm. talks about real life flights that went wrong. And they do like a whole like reenactment thing, too. Mm -hmm. But every time, and, and I, I haven't really paid attention to the show. I just kind of hear the background of it as my brother watches it because uh, we're all kind of stuck inside this room, <laughs> all, right. all of us. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's the idea of what responsibility the pilot has for the passengers and how that's a massive, massive 
corporate, political, government responsibility when it comes to flights. Like it's actually a really big deal. Mm -hmm. So the idea of someone who saves a flight also being in the wrong. So you're half a hero, half the villain. It's so fascinating. And that's stuff they talk about in that real life show uh, that my brother watches. That's almost like docu style. So I think this is a fascinating premise itself. Um, and also full disclosure, uh, I'm actually, my brother and I are both really interested in getting our pilot license. Uh, uh, cause we both want to fly. <laughs> my yeah. brother's actually better than me. He's, he's done flight simulations and I haven't. Um, but it's that idea of having that much power behind your hands in your hands. Right. And it's super like agro masculine <laughs> attitude of just like, I have this power, I control this ship. Uh, but, but you're flying it in the air and you're, you have that responsibility on top of you and that pressure. Um, it's yeah. really fascinating. I don't know what your thoughts, Sabrina, are on this movie. Yeah, I saw it once actually in theaters when it first came out. Um, I remember I would go to the theater by my um, like middle school, junior high, high school all the time. So this was one of them that I got to go see. Denzel is obviously always so great. And it is interesting because I didn't know people complained about the depiction of alcoholism in it because if you've known or have experienced anything with alcoholism, it is very serious. So sometimes with a story like this, you do have to portray it the way it is. If some, cause is this one based on a real person or no? Not particularly. Okay. Okay. Cause I didn't know that if they were trying to be like sensitive or like whatever, but even in a story like the way back, we see Ben Affleck. It is hard to watch sometimes when you're seeing somebody go through what they are because it is very real and it is very difficult. Um, so I didn't know about that, but yeah, I think, I think this is a really great movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, obviously it's fascinating. Go ahead. RB3. It's fine. It, I, it's, it, it does a great job for, for, uh, um, portraying alcoholism. There is, I mean, I, I can kind of see the criticism because there is a moment at the end of the film that is a little funny where he, before, cause you know, obviously after this whole flight thing happens in the first act, he has to like a answer for it and trial. And like, mm -hmm. they basically had the defense like all lined up for him. And he, all he had to do was basically like just show up. And then he showed up, he, the night before he's in again, another hotel room. He, he gets like flat out drunk. John Goodman comes in. He's like, okay, we got to fix this. And he pulls out like a, like a thing of cocaine and is like, here, take this. And just shoves it in his face. And then he goes into court like, <laughs> as if nothing happened. So it is it, yeah. it is funny, like in that sense, uh, how it's kind of like, like you have to use another vice to overcome the, the original vice. Um, yeah. This is really, it's, uh, but overall though, I, I think it's a really well done movie. Uh, uh, this is, but there's a couple of fun facts here that I didn't realize until looking it up before we came on on, on the podcast here. Um, apparently, this is the first uh, between Castaway and this. This is this only the first live action movie that Robert Zemeckis did since Castaway, and they both featured plane crashes. Um, uh, yeah. Also, this was the first time Denzel had been nominated for an Oscar since he won for Training Day. Um, Yo. so like, it's like he had like a whole 12 year period where he wasn't nominated for anything. And then he got nominated for this. Oh, mm -hmm. Fences was after this, right? Yeah. Fences was after this. Yeah. 2016. But yeah, I mean, yeah, overall, I mean, I, again, a lot of people think it's goofy. A lot of people think it's a little over the top. I've always just thought it was a really, really good movie. And Robert Zemeckis himself is a pilot. So, uh, that oh, also go. gives it more of like a mm -hmm. little personal angle. I'm sure that's probably his motivation for making it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really, uh, I really enjoy this movie overall. Yeah. Again, everything you said, the, the fact that Robert Zemeckis is a pilot, like it really is like the more I watch or the more I hear about that show, my brother watches, the more it's so interesting to me. The idea of being a pilot is so half powerful, half technical, half responsible. It, it's a, it's such an interesting mix that I personally want to experience, which is why I want to fly. Um, wow. I think that would just be the coolest thing, which is why I said my brother and I want to have our pilot license, uh, because I really think that'd be an interesting effect. And the more I read about it, the more I'm like, Ooh, I want to do that. <laughs> I'm going to be yeah. like Ben Affleck in that Pearl Harbor movie Hey, <laughs> oh and God. die. No, I'm kidding. Um, that was the other guy. Uh, either way, man, the last one we have lined up here is the walk. Cause we already talked about, um, all the other movies. So I know Can you had some words. 
Oh, go ahead. Are we are we doing um like any like special little like ones that stick out to us that we haven't talked about? Oh, sure. If there's any one that that sticks out to you, Sabrina, go ahead. Well, if you could talk about the walk first, if you want to, and then oh. we could get to that. Yeah. yeah, I just want to shout out the walk. I remember seeing it in theaters, <laughs> IMAX 3D. Um, I really, I was a big fan of Joseph Gordon Levitt. In fact, it's funny. Speaking of Joseph Gordon Levitt, we we did our throwback episode of uh, Spielberg when we talk about genre movies. And then one of the, uh, you know how we used to do the comment section during um, mm -hmm. um, read the comments. We the previous episode Tony before Wagner. Was, yeah, Tony Wagner. Hey, shout out to Tony Wagner. Um, the one of our comments was talking about Joseph Gordon Levitt being good in Looper because the episode before we did was the Ryan Johnson episode, and then uh, and 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 we're talking about how unfortunately Joseph Gordon Levitt had like a long string of failures and misses, like box office wise, to which eventually led to not really being in movies anymore, which kind of sucks because. I think in The Walk and in a bunch of other movies, he's a really, really good actor. Like he's really, mm -hmm. really good. Um, so I, I, I miss, I miss JGL. I hope he comes back in more things. Five Hundred Days of Summer, obviously. Um, Looper, The Walk, um, the, night all, the Night Before, which is also yeah. great. One of my favorite Christmas movies. Um, so yeah, salute to that, and also salute to the documentary that The Walk is based off of, Man on Wire. Um, I think this is one of the rare examples where maybe the documentary might be a little more popular than the movie. Um, the documentary won the Oscar in 2008 for uh, Best Documentary, and I personally think it is one of the greatest documentaries of all time. Um, and the movie, the movie, funny enough, tries to reenact the documentary <laughs> in a lot of weird ways, which you never really see, um, but it's really, really cool and fun. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, JGL, man, that guy disappeared. Remember yeah. the Oliver Stone movie he did? Uh, Snowden. Snowden? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, that guy. Dead. That guy was everywhere, man. I thought I thought people liked that guy. Mm -hmm. Um apparently not cuz he's gone. <laughs> well, he does uh, hit record. I know. Yeah. I know. He, he does his own company. He does hit record. He does a lot of yeah. stuff. I'm sure you know, he'll be back and obviously he still makes appearances and stuff and uh mm -hmm. I love when he talks about the Dark Knight Rises cuz it's super interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he did like a very candid interview like a while back that I heard about Dark Knight Rises and how he felt. And I was like, this is super fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, JGL, man, that's a good one. Uh, Sabrina, do you have one that you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, I don't know if you guys have seen this one, but have you seen Death Becomes Her? No. I have not, no. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you guys definitely have to check it out because it is super interesting. It's kind of this like funny satire horror comedy obviously has Meryl Streep Goldie Hawn they're both incredible it did win the Oscar for best visual effects that year too um I forgot what year it came out um I think it was early 90s definitely and um yeah it's just it's kind of like again a satire about like America's obsession with like youth and beauty it basically is like one one of them steals the husband of the other and then she comes back and she's just like, oh, look, like I'm so radiant. I'm so youthful. I have this like, like potion. It's, it's great. It's really interesting, especially as, in a visual effects standpoint too. It is really, really cool what he did. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this guy has done so many movies that it, it's just incredible. I mean, he, yeah. he did a lot of misses, but still a lot of really classic movies that a lot of people regard as like all timers mm -hmm. so yeah a, lot, a huge shout out to robert zemeckis for giving us a lot of modern cinema that we have today because without him who knows where we would be uh just purely in the cinematic scale purely technology wise i mean this guy did a lot so either way guys that is our episode on robert zemeckis thank you so much for listening hopefully you listen all the way through i know we went <laughs> a little longer uh, but thank you for listening. Subscribe to First Cut if you haven't done so already. And follow us at First Cut TMO. And you can follow us individually. I'm at Squally to Race, RB3. At Director RB3. At Sabrina X Monica. Yeah, guys. Uh, for the First Cut crew and the meaning of podcast, we're peacing out. Peace out, guys. <laughs> <laughs>